Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to part three of our 7.1 lecture. This section will focus on the unification of Italy, which is one of the most important political developments of the real politic period. Uh, on this uh, first image right here, I'd like to point out some significant uh, figures in the Italian independence movement. On the far left, we have uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, who had, was a revolutionary who was very active in the revolutions of 1830 and 1848 in Italy, which unfortunately were not successful. In the center, we have Count Camillo di Cavour, the prime minister of Piedmont, Sardinia, and a real politique leader who will be instrumental in the unification of the Italian peninsula. And finally, on the right, Giuseppe Garibaldi, another romantic nationalist um, and protege of Mazzini, who will also play a very important role in the unification of Italy. <clears throat> so let's first provide some context as to what has been hap happening in Italy in the first half of the century. <clears throat> Italy was one of many states that was reorganized after the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna maintained the decentralization of Italy, establishing it as nine different states across the peninsula. Um, these states were either controlled by Austria or by conservative monarchies, like the House of Savoy in Piedmont or the House of Bourbon in the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. This maintained uh, centuries and centuries of decentralization in the Italian peninsula. Italy had not been unified since the days of the Roman Empire in the 5th century CE. And in fact, the term Italy was really just a geographic term to describe this region of Europe. Now, efforts for unification and also liberalization of various Italian states began in the 1920s, or sorry, the 1820s and the 1830s with a movement known as the Risorgimento. The Risorgimento was this political and social movement for Italian unification. And in the first part of the century, it was largely led by Giuseppe Mazzini, a romantic nationalist and revolutionary who was also the founder and leader of a um, revolutionary group known as Young Italy that fought in the 1830 and 1848 revolutions. Now, as we know, those revolutions failed to bring any significant change to Italy's political state. And as a result, Mazzini, the, the passionate uh, romantic nationalist that he was, wore only black following the failures of these revolutions. And he vowed to remain in mourning until Italian unification was achieved. However, Mazzini was not the only leader in a potential unification movement. Uh, there was also Vincenzo, Vincenzo Gioberti. Vincenzo Gioberti was actually a Catholic priest in the first part of the 19th century who called for a federation of existing Italian states under the leadership of the Pope. So he also wanted to see a unification of Italy, but as a priest, he wanted it to be a country unified under the papacy, whereas Mazzini wanted to see more of a, of a unification under a, say, liberal or more socialist Republican government. Now, the difference in the goals between Mazzini and Gioberti represents a lot of the divisions that had undermined the 1848 revolution and other um, movements for unification in the first part of the uh, 19th century. And overall, many of uh, most of this energy, right, these revolutionary movements, whether they were led by Mazzini or, or by Gioberti, were influenced by France and France's revolutions and nationalism and its relative success by comparison when it came to revolutions. Now, the revolutions of 1848 in Italy were largely a failure. Like I said, they were inspired by France's 1848 revolution. And as a result, this led to uprisings in several Italian states, such as Sicily in the south, Lombardy and Venezia in the north, also Rome and in Piedmont, Sardinia. These revolts were largely against conservative governments, 
and had the goal of establishing a liberal, unified government all across Italy. The king of Piedmont, Sardinia, um, actually became the leader of this War of Liberation in 1848. However, as I mentioned, it was a failure as Austria, which was kind of Italy's babysitter, crushed the rebellions in Lombardy and Venezia, and the French under Napoleon III also intervened to support the Pope in Rome and crush rebellions in the Papal States and in Central Italy. Piedmont Sardinia was actually able to escape um, any interference by Austria or France, and Piedmont Sardinia, because it had already existed as an independent kingdom, was able to retain its liberal constitution. So the um, after the revolutions of 1848, it was very clear that the papacy and also Austria opposed unification in Italy. They also opposed any or all modern trends like republicanism or liberalism, and uh, especially because the Pope had been driven from Rome during the revolutions of 1848. So we will see that the papacy continues to be a very conservative institution. And the papacy continued to have a lot of political influence and control, not only in Rome, but also across central Italy. And Austria continued to have a lot of control in northern Italy, especially in the regions of Lombardy and Venezia. So this meant that Piedmont Sardinia was now the leader of any potential unification movement in the second half of the 19th century. At the time, Piedmont Sardinia was ruled by King Victor Emmanuel II, Vittorio Emanuele Dure, an Italian, and uh, Victor Emmanuel II was more uh, was a more liberal monarch than we had seen recently. Um, Piedmont Sardinia had a, a liberal constitutional monarchy, which was more attractive to a lot of middle class liberals across Italy who were fearful of, say, Giuseppe Mazzini's radical republicanism. And uh, Victor Emmanuel II would appoint. Um, a prime minister, this is going to be Camilo, Count Camilo de Cavour, who we'll discuss in the next slide. And uh, Cavour will use the real politique strategy as a means for unification instead of the idealism and romanticism of Mazzini. So under Cavour, we will see a very Machiavellian approach to uh, the very Machiavellian real politique approach to unification. I want to go back briefly here to this map. Uh, this map shows the geographic, uh, geographic and political layout of Italy um, prior to unification. So you can see that southern Italy is basically one state called the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. This was led by a branch of the House of Bourbon, so a traditional conservative monarchy. The Pope controlled the Papal States here in central Italy and also had a lot of influence in these states of Tuscany, Romagna, Modena, Parma. Um, Austria directly controlled Venezia and Lombardy here. And then the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia is up here in sort of the northwestern portion of Italy. This is modern day Piedmont and then also referring down here to the island of Sardinia. This was the territory that was ruled by the House of Savoy, the monarchy for the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia. King Victor Emmanuel II, once again, is the King of Piedmont, Sardinia, as we begin this story, and he has just appointed Count Camilo di Cavour as his Prime Minister. And Cavour, you might remember, is one of our three important real politique leaders. So Cavour was also a liberal-minded nobleman. All right, so he's from the, uh, the aristocratic class, but he was uh, a liberal in terms of his political stance. He was a nationalist, but not a radical nationalist. He was more of a moderate nationalist. And as such, he favored a constitutional government, like a constitutional monarchy, but not a republic. Um, Cavour was also the editor of a newspaper called Il Risorgimento, 
And Il Risorgimento newspaper, which of course was named after the Risorgimento movement, um, argued that Sardinia, Piedmont Sardinia, should be the foundation for this new unified Italy. And we will see that ultimately all of Italy will unify under the leadership of Piedmont Sardinia and King Victor Emmanuel II. Now, Cavour is considered to be one of the best politicians of his age, like I said, a real politique. And this is largely because of his ability to create an alliance between the aristocracy, which tended to be more conservative and fearful of liberal developments, and the middle class, uh, which did have more liberal tendencies. He united these two groups and even to some extent the working class and the radicals under the banner of a strong nation state and Italian unification. Now, before Piedmont Sardinia could lead the unification of Italy, um, it had to become a more liberal and economically viable state. So Cavour is going to focus his first years on building up Piedmont Sardinia to be a strong state to lead unification. The new constitution of Piedmont Sardinia was modeled on the French constitution of 1830, it guaranteed some civil liberties. It guaranteed a parliamentary government with elections, not necessarily universal male suffrage, but still elections to the middle class. And this parliament was allowed to control taxes. Um, Cavour also reformed the judicial system to make it more equitable and liberal. He focused on building infrastructure, right, bringing Piedmont Sardinia into the Industrial Revolution. Um, he also expanded credit to stimulate investment, much like we saw Napoleon III do in France. He reduced the influence of the Catholic Church, which tended to inhibit modernization in uh, regions where it had influence. And he also used a lot of this economic uh, profit to strengthen the army because he recognized that war would be an inevitable element of the process of unification. Because Cavour knew that Italian unification was dependent on expelling Austria, Austria's presence in Italy was specifically for the purpose of preventing Italian unification. But Piedmont Sardinia was not capable of taking on Austria single-handedly. Piedmont Sardinia needed a powerful ally to help defeat Austria, and so that is when Cavour reached out to Napoleon III and France. He proposed that if Piedmont Sardinia and France established an alliance against Austria, then France could gain territory, specifically these regions now known as Nice and Savoy, and they would solidify this alliance with a good old-fashioned marriage between um, uh, the children of Victor Emmanuel II and Napoleon III. Now, Napoleon III was very excited about this potential alliance because he believed that he could uh, trick Cavour and that he would ultimately, he being Napoleon III, would be able to control Italy. He thought that this would be better for France than it would be for Italy. That's not how this is going to work out, but regardless, that was Napoleon's motivation for joining this alliance. So Cavour is able to provoke Austria into war against 1859. And so this is just a small Italian war with Austria on one side and France with Piedmont Sardinia on the other side. And France and Piedmont Sardinia actually won the first two battles against Austria. So they won those first two battles, but they did not completely defeat Austria because Austria still had the potential to turn this small war into a lengthy conflict. And that's what ultimately made Napoleon III nervous about this whole alliance. He did not want to get into a long extended conflict with Austria. And Napoleon also was growing concerned about the power of a unified Italy because um, in the aftermath of these two first victories, this had inspired revolutionary uprisings across Italy, especially in the northern states, Lombardy, Venezia, Modena, Parma, Tuscany, Romagna. 
So Italy was already um, showing some agitation and showing some, move, showing some movement towards unification. And this was making Napoleon III nervous. Napoleon III also was very concerned, and legitimately so, that Prussia might come to Austria's aid, and Napoleon could now be fighting a war against Austria and Prussia. So Napoleon III, in the midst of this conflict, goes behind Cavour's back and makes a secret treaty with Austria, which basically gets France and Austria out of the war. Now, of course, Cavour is furious by this betrayal. He believes that Napoleon has completely undermined um, the, uh, Cavour's plan for unification, especially because at the end of all of this, Piedmont was only able to acquire the province of Lombardy. But what Cavour didn't initially realize is that these, uh, these efforts, you know, the, the, this, this battle against Austria had act was actually like um, had created the momentum for the uprisings across the peninsula because nor other northern states in Italy, places like Parma, Modena, Tuscany, Romagna, were able to rise up, you know, have these, these, um, these rebellions and push out their Austrian, uh, their Austrian lords and, 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 and authority and were actually able to join Piedmont Sardinia in 1860. So by 1860, most of northern Italy is now unified, except for Venezia, the Papal States, and then southern Italy, of course. So you may be wondering, how does Cavour then get the southern states to unify and join the northern states? Well, this is where Giuseppe Garibaldi comes in. So Giuseppe Garibaldi is actually like the complete opposite of Cavour in a lot of ways. Garibaldi was a protege of Mazzini. Therefore, he was this super patriot. He embodied uh, romantic nationalism. He was a true lifelong revolutionary that had fought for independence in Uruguay and some of the South American revolutions. He had even lived in the United States and supported um, uh, for example, the abolition of slavery there. He had lived in other European countries to support their revolutionary movements. And he, of course, had been a strong supporter of Giuseppe Mazzini and a participant with Young Italy in the 1848 revolution. So Garibaldi uh, represents that nationalism and that more radical republicanism and that energy that will fuel part of the unification movement. Now, Garibaldi had developed his own personal army called the Red Shirts. The Red Shirts were this nationalistic army made up of Garibaldi's followers, and they emerged as an independent force in Italian politics. And so Garibaldi could, and his Red Shirt army uh, proved to be um, a very effective force uh, when, it, when it needed in various uh, places in Italy. For example... In response to the success of uh, Cavour in northern Italy, this inspired a revolt down in Sicily, the, the island at the bottom of the boot of Italy. Um, in May 1860, Sicilians began to revolt against the Bourbon king of southern Italy, again inspired by that revolutionary activity to the north. And so as soon as Garibaldi heard about this rebellion, he and his red shirts sailed down to Sicily to join the rebellion, and they were able to successfully expel the Bourbon government and gain control of Sicily by July of 1860. Then, in August of that same year, one month later, Garibaldi and his red shirt army, now supported by a swell of Sicilians as well, crossed to the mainland and began this victorious march up the peninsula. Uh, liberating Italy from the Bourbon monarchy as they as they march, you know, beginning first with Calabria down at the boot of Italy, marching farther and farther north until they gained control of Naples, which had been the capital of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Um, the Red Shirt Army grew with supporters this entire time, and Garibaldi became this 
uh, this almost like George Washington type figure to leading this this revolution and this unification movement. He was very, very popular, and his goal ultimately was to get all the way to Rome and unite Italy from Rome. Now, even though this is very successful, it also made Cavour up in the north very nervous. Okay? Cavour was not a huge fan of Garibaldi's radicalism and he was and, and popularity and he was also concerned that this uh, that an attack on Rome by Garibaldi's red shirt army might provoke France and France might intervene as the traditional defenders of the papacy and prevent uh, Italy from unifying and will potentially undo all the work and all the uh, uh, and everything they had achieved over the past few years. Cavour also was fearful that a direct attack on Venezia in northeastern Italy could also provoke Austria and or Prussia if not handled correctly. And like I said, he was fearful of Garibaldi's radicalism and popularity. He did not want Italy to unify under sort of the radical ideology of Garibaldi. He had wanted Italy to unify under the moderate liberalism of Piedmont Sardinia. So Cavour actually will send troops from Piedmont Sardinia down to stop Garibaldi's red shirts. And so for a few moments there, it looks like Italy, instead of unifying, could be headed towards a civil war. However, Garibaldi, as a seasoned, lifelong revolutionary, recognized that the larger issue here was not his own radicalism and popularity, but rather it was the success of the overall unification. And so Garibaldi ultimately conceded to the superior, superiority and authority of Cavour and Piedmont Sardinia, and he ultimately sided with Cavour. He supported Cavour to achieve the larger goal of unification. And so this alliance, you know, of, of the sort of moderate liberalism of Northern Italy and the radicalism in Southern Italy was unified in, this, in, the, in, 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 the, in the peninsula, right? Italy is almost entirely unified now. There was a huge victory parade in Naples with King Victor Emmanuel II and Garibaldi riding through the streets and the unification uh, was justified and, and, and officiated through a variety of plebiscites, meaning votes, in the southern territories. And every territory except for Rome and Venezia voted to join uh, with the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia. So officially and formally, Italian unification was achieved in March of 1861. Italy was now a constitutional monarchy under the Piedmont king, Victor Emmanuel II, and this included all of Italy except Rome and Venezia. However, Rome and Venezia would eventually be added to the Italian state. Venezia would be added um, in 1866 after Austria loses that territory in the Austro-Prussian War, which we'll discuss in a little while, and Rome was able to join the rest of the Italian state after France withdrew their troops in the Franco-Prussian War. So actually the unification of Germany under Prussia is what will lead to the final two states being added to Italy. I would also like to show you uh, this building here. This building is a very, very famous building in the city of Rome. Um, it was built to commemorate the unification of Italy. It's this big, huge building, like right by the Colosseum and the Roman Forum and all these other major historical sites. Um, its formal name is the Monumento Nazionale of Vittorio Emanuele Due, which basically means the National Monument of Vittorio uh, of Victor Emanuel II, and it's um, uh, in short, it's called the Vittoriano, the Vittoriano Building. But I will tell you. Uh, that the Romans actually call it the wedding cake because they believe that it is big and gaudy and it sticks out like a sore thumb, like its wage is too opulent and it, and it does not fit in with the aesthetic of the rest of the city. So 
in terms of like, you know, the architecture and the aesthetic, the Romans actually really don't like it and they call it the wedding cake. But if you ever travel to Rome, you will definitely um, see this building because it's right there in the middle of the city. So here, this map shows us how Italy has unified, right? You can see the green territory that was initially um, the kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia. All the blue territory, that is what uh, made up the initial unified state of Italy, uh, this little province of Lucca. Don't worry about it. It will be uh, acquired sooner or later. And then Venezia up here in the northeast, that would join the rest of the Italian state in 1866. And then the papal states surrounding Rome would join in 1870. So by 1870, the peninsula would have complete unification. However, even though Italy was unified, it was a very conservative country, and it was also not a very strong country. We will see that when like Germany unifies, it is a powerhouse. It dramatically changes the balance of power in Europe. And while the unification of Italy is significant, it will not send the same shock waves across Europe. This is because Italy, as a constitutional monarchy, still had many conservative tendencies. Uh, it still had a very small minority for male suffrage. Only about 2% of the uh, male population was able to vote. There were lots of pretty significant social class divisions, a, a very wide wealth gap between the very rich and the very poor. There were regional divisions in Italy as well, such as a more progressive, industrialized northern Italy. And then southern Italy was characterized as being rural and economically stagnant and, and quite impoverished. Um, and to some extent, this reflects modern regional divisions in Italy as well. Even in modern day Italy, all of the big fashion houses like Gucci and Prada are located in northern Italy. The car factories like Fiat are located in northern Italy. And while southern Italy has, yes, industrialized, um, it does not have that same wealth and infrastructure as the north. Now, throughout the later 19th uh, century and early 20th century, this actually resulted in massive uh, immigration out of southern Italy to the Americas. Thousands and thousands of Italians would be forced to leave areas like Sicily, and Naples and Calabria and Puglia, these places in southern Italy, because it was so poor, they simply could not support themselves. And many of those families moved to, say, either Argentina in uh, South America or in uh, the New York, New Jersey area, but in the United States. So many Americans who have Italian American ancestry can probably trace it back to the migrations that came out of southern Italy in this period. So that's the story of Italian unification, and that ends part three of our lecture. Stay tuned for part four, which is German unification.